uh, so, so um, depending on who you talk to, being the standard barrier for ethics across the river may not be a very high bar. <laughs> uh, so, but it's great to be here. Uh, so thank you very much um, for staying through the afternoon. And I'm very much looking forward to uh, spending some time with you. I want to start off by saying that I am not at all an expert in artificial intelligence, let alone the digital economy. Okay, so my approach to these issues really is from the perspective of somebody who's interested in the question of what are the responsibilities of business managers right, with regard to customers, investors, employees, and society more generally. But the thing is, the digital economy is pretty much impossible to ignore. Right? So here in 2015, Amazon becomes more valuable than Walmart. If we look at the market cap of the 10 largest companies last year, basically seven of the 10 are technology companies. So for anybody who's interested right, in the responsibilities of business, it is basically impossible to ignore thinking about issues of artificial intelligence, technology more generally, right, and the digital economy. Right? And this isn't just for technology companies, right? because every company also uses technology. So, so as much as I was hoping right, to avoid having to learn anything about artificial intelligence, right, I find myself in the position of really finding that this is basically what keeps me up at night now. Right? And so what I'm here today to do is really to learn from you. And the way in which I want to do this is, is asking the question, what's new from the perspective of business ethics if we think about it in the context of the digital economy? Right? So in looking at the program, I noticed that some titles of the talk had a question mark. Some of them didn't. It's supposed to have a question mark. <laughs> because I am really interested in trying to work through with you What's different about the responsibilities of business if we think about it from the perspective of within the digital economy? Right? So first what I want to do is ask the question, we've been talking a lot about human rights, ethics, artificial intelligence, but let's start by asking what changes in our discussion if we think about it from the perspective of business? What does adding business right, to that conversation change about things? I think there was some of that already in the last discussion, right, in thinking about oversight committees. Um, so we'll pick up on that theme a little bit. Uh, then I want to say a little bit about something of what counts as responsible business. Like, what do we actually mean when we talk about business ethics? Um, uh, so there, for me, there was a lot of learning with regard to what is you know, um, <clears throat> machine learning. Right? And so I hope this will be somewhat new to you, if, if, if not too repetitive, but I hope it will be um, somewhat helpful in that regard. And then turn to one way in thinking about uh, responsible business. That's a framework that I've been working on for the past couple of years, which I call getting back to basics. And, and then ask what, if anything, changes about that framework in thinking about the responsibility of the business in the context of the digital economy. And then turning to next steps. What can we think about going forward with regard to this? Um, because I think, as Matthias mentioned earlier, this really is a, a broad kind of collaborative effort in bringing people together, um, even those of us across the river. And, and so I very much look forward to thinking about what could be next steps with regard to that collaboration in the context of thinking about responsible business in the digital economy. <clears throat> so in terms of what changes by focusing on business, I think most people point to this. And this was a cartoon from The New Yorker <laughs> that um, uh, a graduate student friend of mine gave to me back in 2001 uh, when I was heading off to teach at the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. <laughs> and I've kept this on my desk ever since. <laughs> and so I think when most people think about what changes with regards to technology, human rights, ethics, artificial intelligence, is this concern here. Right? Things are going to get much worse. Right? Because we're not just motivated by innovations and technology, not just motivated by trying to help people, say, for example, to better health care records, but we're actually motivated now by something much else, by greed. So I think that's the first thing that people point to if we're thinking about how does it change right, if we bring business into the picture, um, really makes things much worse. Now I'm going to come back to this point, and I want to spend a lot of time talking about this point. But before we get to this point, I want to point out two other ways in which actually it may almost not make things more complicated or, or, or more difficult, uh, but actually there's some ways in which actually maybe it simplifies also our focus too. Right? And this is what I have in mind. 
In thinking about technology, artificial intelligence, a lot of the concerns about what, what are the things that are technically possible? What are the harms or concerns that might arise? But when we bring business into the picture, right, we're really focusing on what's profitable. Right? And depending on how you, how you understand it, that circle might be bigger or smaller, but certainly we're thinking about profitability both in terms of what's actually financially feasible, right, not just technologically feasible, and what are the kinds of innovations for which there actually might be some form of consumer demand. Right? And, and so that, I think, narrows our focus in a way not dissimilar from, I think, what um, Barbara Gross talked about was we want to focus on the immediate issues. Right? Let's not worry about, and not, not to put aside your talk earlier this morning, Matthias, about the, the middle term and the long term, but there's also the immediate term. Right? And, and so part of focusing on what's profitable really gets us down to thinking about what actually are the specific issues that people face right now with regard to concerns, with regard to human intelligence, uh, artificial intelligence, human rights. Um, now, some of you might be wondering, how is it actually possible that there are things that are profitable that are not technically possible? And, and, and that's what I refer to as fraud. <clears throat> <laughs> <laughs> the other thing to keep in mind is that when we talk about business, we're talking about oftentimes large organizations. So this is the org chart from Microsoft, I think, back in 2006. Um, but the point is that the technology is not just being deployed in the economy but the technology is also being deployed within organizations. Right? And, and that, I think, brings both um, positive features right, and potentially negative features as well. Right? Now, the negative features are such that you may think, well, if it's an organization, um, things get lost, people don't know what's going on. Uh, but at the same time, organizations are oftentimes very slow to adapt. Right? Um, there are checks and balances built in with the system. There are competing interests within the system. And so in that sense, actually, there's also a kind of a built-in ecosystem with regard to thinking about the deployment of these technologies, that slows things down and also allows for multiple sources and perspectives on them. And so I think something else to keep in mind, and the Oversight Committee point I think is an example of that, but there's something else to keep in mind when we talk about business in concrete terms with regard to these questions about um, ethics and human rights and artificial, and artificial intelligence and uh, technology. So, so that's sort of, I think, helpful to keep in mind. Yes, there is the greed, profit motive point. Right? That certainly can't be avoided. But, but before we sort of focus on that solely, I also want to keep in mind that focusing on business, I think, helps to ground the discussion in a certain kind of way uh, by profitability concerns and also uh, by putting it in the context of organizations. Right? Also helps us to think a little bit about um, what are the ways in which we can try to address these concerns? So I hope we can keep that in the background in the context of our discussion. But these, I actually have been keep, keeping track of the time. Are you keeping track of the time? Yeah, you have plenty. What? <laughs> it's, it's five if we're done by six. Yeah, because I know we started differently, so I wasn't quite oh, sure. Oh, yeah, you, yeah you, okay. you've gone for 10 minutes now. So okay, so. great. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so what do we mean by responsible business? What counts as responsible business? Uh, so you know, I think all of us have experienced the moment where somebody asks us, you know, what do you do? And so I say, well, you know, I, I uh, teach business ethics. And um, this is often one of the responses that we get, <laughs> the literary types. Uh, for, the, for the mathematically inclined, uh, this is the response that I get. <clears throat> And, and so, you know, it's, it's, that's not a common response. So the question is, so what do we actually bring by business ethics in the context of this discussion? Um, I think a starting point, and, and part of the reason for this, people often sort of, like, Milton Friedman, I think, is the view that people have in mind when they think about business, right? That the responsibility, the only responsibility is to engage in activities designed to increase its profits so long as it stays within the rules of the game, which is to say engages in open and free competition without a definite profit. I think that's sort of the standard view, it's a slightly better view than the null set view or the oxymoron view, because at least in this view, right, the rules of the game. Um, it's open and free competition, uh, not engaging in deception, not engaging in fraud. So there are rules of the game. Uh, and, then, and then within that, the purpose and the sole responsibility is to maximize profits. Right? And that's the way it sort of often gets interpreted maximizing profits then moves to something like shareholder primacy. What you're really trying to do is actually not just maximize profits, but maximize shareholder returns subject to uh, constraints, right, such as fraud, deception, competition, and the like. 
And so they, this is the view that most people have in mind when they think about business ethics, right? As I said before, it's slightly elevated from the null set view or the oxymoron view. Um, and I think this is the starting point for most of us in the context of business ethics with regard to thinking about what actually does count as responsible business. Most people, just like they want to respond to the Milton, the Chicago School view of, of uh, changing light bulbs <laughs> that came up earlier, um, want to challenge this view as well. And so we see a, a plethora of views <coughs> right, that people have put forward with regard to how to think about differently about the responsibilities of business. So we have um, social enterprise. Uh, my colleague Michael Porter has developed creating shared value as a way to think about the responsibilities of business. There's conscious capitalism. People have mentioned that in terms of Whole Foods. Uh, there's triple bottom line, right? So in addition to thinking about profits, you should think about people and the planet, the environment, sustainability, um, stakeholder theory, I think a very common view, that it's not about the shareholders only, but it's about all the other stakeholders, such as customers, employees, suppliers, society more generally. Um, and then there's a certified B Corporation moving to the more legal conception of things, where we're thinking about, actually, let's think about a different kind of corporate form where it isn't simply about thinking in terms of the responsibilities to maximize shareholder value, right, or the interests of the corporation, but also other considerations in society more broadly. So I think this is kind of a sense of, of a very broad sense of, of the way in which many people in management schools, in the broader managerial community, right, have come to think about the responsibilities of business, in particular with regard to society, uh, as sort of a response to the shareholder primacy, Milton Friedman view of things. I think a large part of the problem is that this is driven by um, a conception of what the duties of managers are. And I think a lot of it is driven by the view that managers have the responsibility to maximize shareholder value. And it's not just, it's a legal responsibility. And, and I think part of the problem is actually that's not the case. right? It may in practice turn out to be what it is that managers think they ought to do, but if we think about from the legal perspective, right, this is not at all the case. Right? I should just have the deck sort of explain this to everybody. But, but basically the duties of directors right, and officers of the corporation is phrased in terms of loyalty. Right? So this is a duty not to essentially engage in appropriating corporate opportunities for yourself. Right? It's a duty of care right, in the activities that you undertake. And it's also a duty of candor to disclose information that's relevant to the business. And so that's not at all about maximizing shareholder returns. And the courts will generally uphold directors' decisions if those decisions are informed, untainted by conflicts, and they're taken in the good faith belief that they are in the best interest of the corporation and its shareholders. So that can be interpreted as maximizing shareholder value as being the responsibility of a manager or a director or an officer, but it's not necessarily required by the law. Okay, and I think that's sort of one of the important things to keep in mind in this conversation because many people, right, I think, sort of start from here and have been trying to sort of develop alternatives to the kind of view that Milton Friedman first espoused. And so I actually want to suggest that once we keep this in mind, the Milton Friedman view actually, in some ways, is not a bad place to start with a few adjustments. So if you recall, the Milton Friedman view is about maximizing, no, not maximizing, sorry, it's about uh, making profits, right? making profits uh, subject to various kinds of constraints. Um, I, I am interested uh, in, in a slightly different view, a slightly different tweak that starts with the definition of business given by the second dean at Harvard Business School. So this is so like, my, my talk is like talking about things that are like, ancient as far as artificial intelligence is concerned, right? <laughs> so, you know, it's like over 100 years old. Okay. But the idea is that business is the activity of making things to sell to profit decently. And, and, and this is sort of two differences, I think, from the Friedman view that are helpful for thinking about the role of business in society. One is that, first of all, it's about making things. It's not just about profiting. It's about making things to sell to profit. And the other one is to think of it in terms of doing so decently. And so with that in mind, what I want to suggest is that business ethics, theories of business ethics, um, are basically one way to help answer the question, 
of how and how much should we profit. So by how is what is the activity we're undertaking to profit? What are the limits or constraints on that? Are we doing it decently? Right. And how much should we profit? Is our profit, in some sense, reasonable with regard to that? And so there are lots of answers that one could give to this question, but that's how I want to frame basically the central question of business ethics. Right? How and how much should we profit? And so with that, I just want to share with you briefly uh, one approach to trying to address that, that question um, that I've been working on. And, and I, 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 I'd like to think that this is sort of a helpful way also for thinking about the issues of ethics as they come up in the context of artificial intelligence and also the digital economy more generally. And the approach is called getting back to basics. I, I, um, I'm conflicted about, about this, this, this title. It, 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 there's an air of presumptuous, you know, it's kind of presumptuous, sort of getting back to basics, you know, like, you know, you know, like the education movement. So I, I, so I apologize. Um, but uh, 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 it, was, it was the best that I could do um, before I had to give a talk. So <laughs> no, 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 not, 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 not today, but, but the time I originally deployed this, this talk a few years ago. Um, I had, so there's basically sort of three basics, as it were. Um, the first basic is of the account is to emphasize the basic constraints that managers ought to observe from the perspective of ordinary or everyday morality. Okay. And, and, and the idea behind this is to get away from thinking that somehow that business ethics is somehow distinctive as a realm of human activity from other areas of human activity. So it has a distinctive kind of ethics to it. But I'd rather say that look, rather than spending our time as business ethicists trying to develop right, new theories for business ethics, right, why not look to ordinary morality? Because I think ordinary morality actually has many of the resources that we need to address questions about what it is that managers should or shouldn't do in the context of business. And, and so that's sort of the first basic uh, uh, that I want to call attention to. And so for example, right, I think one kind of basic uh, principle we could look to is something like do no harm. Um, you'll notice that it's also uh, I, I, it's important to point out for, for um, non-medical audiences that uh, that actually is misattributed. Right? That only entered into the Hippocratic Oath, I think, in like the 1700s or something like that. Um, so that's not part of the original Hippocratic Oath. But anyway, um, it's helpful to be able to um, go back even further in time uh, than the dean at Harvard Business School. All right, the second thing is to think about the basics of commercial activity in a way that is societally valuable. So what I call the societal value proposition. This is in response to all the other theories that we saw earlier, such as triple bottom line, or people focus on profits, people on planets, or the idea of shared value, right, or the idea of, um, say, something like uh, social enterprise. Because all those other approaches, right, think about doing something, about, it's about doing well and doing good. Um, and so it almost concedes, in some sense, that the basic commercial activity of profit making right, is actually not socially valuable. And its social value comes from everything else that you're doing. And I think that's problematic for two reasons. One is that it doesn't recognize the societal value that arises from the activities that result in profits. Right? So you can think of this as actually doing well by doing good, right? by providing jobs, by providing goods and services to consumers by providing returns to investors, that in itself is a kind of societally valuable activity. Uh, the second reason I, I, I worry a little bit about these other theories that focus on, say, social enterprise, mission statement driven organizations, a triple bottom line, is that they almost seed the ground of social responsibility in a way that lets business off the hook. Because a business can now say is like, well, I'm not, a, I'm not a social enterprise, right? so I don't have to worry about social responsibility. That's their problem, right? I'm basically a normal business engaged in profit-making activity, and, and and so that's not my concern. And so those are the two reasons that I, I am a little bit hesitant right, about wanting to go down the road that I think many of my colleagues have gone down with regard to thinking about the responsibilities of business and society in these other kinds of models, and really want to focus on thinking about the basic commercial activity and framing it in a way and undertaking it in a way right, that is societally valuable. And that's sort of what we might call a societal value proposition. And the third basic 
is a nod to John Rawls. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Yes. Oh, sorry. Um, I gave the punchline away. Oh, no, no. Uh, so, so, <laughs> what, 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 no, no, that's actually, well, um, I should have given a spoiler alert. So, so the, the one thing I think that's important about the societal value proposition, and also thinking in terms of the basic um, constraints of ordinary morality, is that if you look at this, uh, we're, we're facing a huge lack of confidence in trusted business. Um, so this is the Gallup survey from last year in the United States. Uh, as you can see, big business right, is basically um, either 25% of people either trusted a great deal or quite a lot. Um, newspapers are even worse. Uh, and electronic media, by the way, social media is sort of similar to where newspapers are as well. That's sort of been added to the, to the survey. Uh, people in business, whenever I give this to a conversation to uh, people in business, they're always very happy to see that Congress is below them. Um, <laughs> uh, um, so, but that, that there's a huge trust, lack of trust in business. And, and I think something like uh, the societal value proposition actually is very important for business to help um, address this lack of trust. Okay? And what I mean by that <clears throat> is this. I think when we normally think about trust, right? do we trust business? Do we trust Congress? Do we trust newspapers? Do we trust the police? We often think in terms of reliability. Right? The idea that they're dependable, right? it's consistent, right? we can sort of rely upon them in that sense. Um, but there are lots of reasons right, that business could be reliable. Right? Business could be reliable if they basically don't want to run afoul of the law. Business could be reliable uh, to maintain a good reputation. And so as uh, institutions weaken, um, if businesses are operating in contexts where institutions may not be so strong as to enforce reliability, um, the ability to rely upon this sense of trust uh, I think grows weaker. And that's really where a second conception of trust becomes important. Right? So we trust another party, not simply because they're reliable, but we trust them because at some level we believe that they have our concerns in mind. Right? So this is trust as goodwill. And I think if businesses could do a better job of undertaking their commercial activity in a way right, that makes clear the societal value proposition, and in other words, there's a benefit to society from engaging in that activity. Right? That's one way to help demonstrate this kind of goodwill, and I think we'll have then the benefit of building up trust again in the context of business. So, so those are sort of um, <clears throat> a little bit, just a quick, quick detour. We, we, I don't, I don't, we, you know, we can talk about how that relates to the discussion of the digital economy, but I just want to get that out there as another idea with regard to thinking about the second basic. And the third one then is to engage appropriately with background legal, political, and societal institutions, and which are commonly referred to as society's basic institutions. Right? So that's the nod to John Rawls. And so the three basics then are, um, in terms of basic constraints, right? framing and undertaking the basics of commercial activity in a way that's society valuable, right? and then finally to engage appropriately with background legal, political, and societal institutions, which you might call the basic institutions. And this is where the human rights come into play. Right. Um, I think Matias showed the Spanish version of this one. Yeah. I, I, I have the English, English version of this one. <laughs> um, now, now there, this is another point here. I, I put this under the basic institutions, right? Because we could think about the human rights as sort of moral, moral, um, moral rights, and then sort of these are moral duties. But I think it's actually helped for, for various reasons. Obviously, it's sort of grounded in the institutional context, and so we can think of these as. Um, uh, respecting institutional rights, uh, and so here John Ruggie right, has framed the responsibilities of business in terms of respecting human rights. This means that they should avoid infringing on the human rights of others and should address adverse human rights impacts with which they are involved. And so under the third basic right, is where I would want to introduce our thinking about human rights in the context of this conference, but also more generally in thinking about the responsibilities of business um, under the getting back to basics framework. So what changes in the digital economy? I mean, this, is, this is really a question. This is, this is really a question. I'm really actually hoping to be able to, to think through this 
with you in the context of, of this, this afternoon. Um, and I want to focus in particular on a version of the first point and, and the third point. Now, if we think about, for example, everything that's going on with regard to the digital economy, um, we might ask the question of, well, are these products and services really society valuable? That's one question certainly we could ask. Um, we also could ask in the light of recent activity on the part of Facebook uh, with Mark Zuckerberg, uh, with Sheryl Sandberg testifying before Congress. We could certainly ask about the third question. Are they engaging appropriately with public institutions and in thinking about trying to shape the form of regulation? We could also ask that question with regard to, say, various companies that um, uh, uh, are engaging in certain activities with regard to their taxes. So certainly there's a lot we could ask with regard to the second and third points right, in the context of the digital economy. But many of those things and those questions that we might ask, I think actually may not be that distinctive for the digital economy. I think those are, for example, the question of companies trying to avoid taxes or companies um, trying to engage in shaping the regulation. That's something that's common, I think, right, for all sorts of businesses. Similarly, are the products, are the goods and services that are being sold, are they valuable to society? Again, I think that's a question that might come up in the context of lots of businesses. But I want to focus on, on really the first one, these constraint questions, right, from the perspective of harm, because I think it's actually there right, that the digital economy does seem to pose, um, maybe not unique, but certainly does raise the stakes, I think, for thinking about the responsibilities of business from the perspective of getting back to basics. And I think for that, it's actually helpful to think about um, Nike, and more generally, the apparel and footwear industry. Uh, and what do I mean by this? When we think about one of the biggest challenges um, that has occupied people in the space of thinking about the responsibilities of business to society, a lot of it has been focused on responsibilities of business in the supply chain with regard to the apparel and footwear industry. This is really where a lot of the discussion started. Okay. Um, and so here you sort of see a timeline of Nike's journey. So in the 1960s, Phil Knight wrote his groundbreaking paper for his master's degree in business at the graduates, uh, the GSB at Stanford, right? which was basically um, on the question of will Japanese sneakers right, disrupt, um, take over the, uh, due, due to German, to, uh, so basically at the time, most of the sneakers were made in Germany by Adidas Puma. And his question was, will Japanese uh, sneakers do to German sneakers what the Japanese cameras did to German cameras? So that was a paper that he wrote back in 1961. In 1964, he started Blue Ribbon uh, Sports, which basically imported Japanese sneakers right, and sold them in the United States. But then in 1971, he renamed it to Nike. And he realized that why was he actually importing these? Right? What he should do was actually design the sneakers and then have them manufactured overseas. Right? And this was the start, really, of the revolution of where the company was simply just a brand about marketing and design. And, and that sort of really revolutionized uh, the uh, footwear and apparel industry. So it wasn't a technological innovation, but really a sort of a business model innovation that sort of changed that. So lots of outsourcing in the 1980s. Then in the 1990s, on, on campuses around um, the United States, came the issue of, of a concern with the working conditions in those factories. And at the time, Nike's response was, they are our subcontractors. We don't make shoes. We don't make clothes. We just basically market and design them. And so they did not take responsibility for the harms that would arise in the context of that supply chain. Finally, in 1997, they implemented a code of conduct to sort of try to increase compliance right, with regard to that code of conduct in the supply chain. Then in 2001, they finally released their first com uh, com corporate responsibility report. In 2009, they engaged in a project where they basically tried to not just focus on compliance, right? At the, of the, but actually bring in to the decision-making within the firm sourcing decisions 
how that would actually be in relation to this. So not sort of making that on, on one dimension, but actually focusing on what are the kinds of issues that are going on in the supply chain, how does that affect, and think about our sourcing decisions. Then later on, more recently, they focused on trying to build the capacity of their supply factories to be able to produce um, shoes and footwear in compliance with their uh, standards, so not just sort of basically monitoring them, but actually helping them develop the capabilities to do so. And then um, uh, in the last couple of years, they've fully integrated right, um, the extent to which companies are meeting certain kinds of standards with regard to sustainability, labor rights, working conditions, into their sourcing decisions along with things like cost, quality, and the speed of delivery. Okay, so that's sort of the journey that they've taken. Along the way, they have put into place at the board of directors level, a committee on corporate responsibility. So that might be analogous to some of the oversight committee that we talked about earlier in the previous session. You can imagine having a committee within right, uh, the board of directors, just as you have an audit committee, right, a nominating committee compensation committee, you could have something like an ethics and technology committee, and they have that with regard to corporate responsibility. And so this is the journey that Nike has taken basically over 50 years. Right. And why is this instructive? I think it's instructive for a number of different levels. One is that um, this really was, I think, for many companies and for those of us in the business ethics community, really one of the first examples of thinking about the responsibilities of business society in a very active way with regard to what companies are doing. The second reason I think this is helpful is that it shows that a lot of our concern with risk and harm is at the level of the operating model, right? the supply chain. Right? What are the working conditions in the supply chain? How can we ensure that these factories are meeting the certain standards of, of the code of conduct? But over time, Nike has come back to the view that actually a lot of the risks and harms are the result of their business model. Because if your model is to try to find the lowest cost producer of shoes and apparel, right, then all the other problems that we talked about before pretty much follow from that business model. And so now they're actually working on thinking about their business model differently because that's perhaps the way in which to address the problems in the supply chain in the first place. And so this is what brings me then to thinking about, well, <clears throat> how is it that companies should think about the kinds of risks that they do? So, so once again, um, I, I apologize for bringing up people that are older than Heidegger. Um, <laughs> you're St. Thomas of Pines, right? And, and so what we have here now is thinking about, well, we have a business plan, or we have a business model, and we want to put it into place. And we engage in certain kinds of steps to do so. Um, and overall, the action of the means to intend a good effects itself seems, seems reasonable. Right? Now the question is, are the harms in the supply chain, right, were they foreseeable? Um, if so, they may be permitted, um, as long as they're unintended. Right? And certainly for the case to be made for those harms to be permissible, uh, they have to be <coughs> proportionately grave reasons for thinking about why we'd want to engage in that activity in the first place. So, so this is basically taking the whole logic of double effect from just for theory, happy to talk about it more. Um, but this is a kind of a very grounded way in which decision makers in business, right, I want to suggest, might want to think through, right, is our business model, is our strategy right, permissible given the kinds of harms that we might imagine arising from engaging in that activity. Um, so that's sort of the idea behind importing what we might call something from sort of ordinary morality into the context of business decision making. And part of the reason I think this is helpful, this also goes back to a comment that Matthias made earlier about the move from thinking about applied ethics, right, to what you might call sort of more practical ethics. So this is basically working from the ground up in the context of an actual decision, right, what are the frameworks that we can actually give to people and tools to think about making that decision. And so, this is one example right, about how you might think about doing that in the context of something like Nike trying to imagine, should we actually put this kind of supply chain into place given this plan of how we want to think about our business. So if risks are unforeseen and unintended, okay, so unforeseen, it's hard to imagine them. Unintended, what we mean by that here is really the risks aren't part of the plan. 
right? The harms aren't part of the necessary steps that we have to take in order to achieve our ends. And I think that a lot of the digital economy risks get presented as basically unforeseen and unintended. <laughs> and so one question is, is that correct? Right? Are the digital economy risks really unforeseen? And, un and uh, there's good reason to think there might be. Right? We're working in a new space, new technologies, innovative technologies. It's very hard to know what's going on with them. Uh, but that's sort of one question that, 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 that comes to mind. Or are they really actually maybe foreseeable in some kind of way? Right? Could companies have known better? And are there certain kinds of risks or harms that are in fact foreseen and intended in the sense that they are actually part of or very close to right, the actual plan that you're putting into place? And, and, and so that's sort of, for me, the question that I would like to see people in business right, grapple with in the context of thinking about the digital economy, artificial intelligence, things like that. So I want to sort of throw out a few examples right, where we think about the technology, not just as a technology, but in the context of the business model, right, and ask, are the kinds of risks that we've come to associate with that, um, are they really unforeseen and unintended? Or are they perhaps foreseen but still not part of the plan, or maybe are they in certain cases foreseen and actually those risks and harms are such that they actually, it's pretty hard to execute the plan without incurring those harms and risks. And this has to be not just from the technology, right? This is actually in the context of the business model itself. So one example is, uh, this is taken from Vivek's uh, Report, right? Does that look familiar? Yes. So it's about <laughs> online content moderation, standards for enforcement. Okay, so there's been a lot of discussion over the last couple of days about how we think about online content moderation. Right. But if we think back to the Nike example, online content moderation, in a way, is like trying to get the factories right, to comply with certain standards. Right. It's about saying we have this business model in place. And the question is, what can we do, given that business model, to try to contain certain kinds of harms or risks or minimize them? I think that's, that, that for me, I mean, I, that may not, like for those of you in the artificial intelligence world, that may not be a crazy analogy. But from a business perspective, actually, I don't think it's that far off. I think there actually is something along the lines of thinking, look, Facebook, Instagram, there's this business model, right? And then we basically have to work to try to ensure that certain harms don't arise as a result of that business model by engaging this content moderation. And so one question is, and this would be an interesting question to explore with you, is if we actually had a different business model for Facebook, would our concern with these harms actually be somewhat reduced? There still always be those kinds of concerns, but would the risks maybe not rise to the level that they have with regard to this? Right? So for example, if we think about um, the idea of um, referrals, right? new, new moderation, right? whether it's on YouTube, things like this, uh, thinking about in terms of um, trying to keep people online because the business model is relying on keeping people online with regard to ad revenue. Insofar as those are part of the business model, right, then are these risks here actually heightened in some kind of way? So that's sort of one example of what we think about the business model. How does that change our assertion of the risk? And then we move the question of the risk and harm from the execution side, actually thinking if we change the business model, right, can we address those harms? And then we don't have to worry so much about content moderation as the only way to think about addressing those problems. Here's a second example about ride sharing. Right? Um, so these are nine other alternative ride sharing platforms right, to Uber and Lyft. Um, some of these might be familiar to you. Uh, so for example, um, Safra is, is, is one that's for women only. Uh, to avoid certain kinds of, of risks that come from, from riding in cars that have occurred with, with regard to assault and harassment for people. Um, uh, Arrow, which is the, the blue A, that's one that actually is, you may know it, it uses only certified taxi cabs. Right? So it actually is a ride, it's a, it's a platform for taxi cabs right? and not simply private um, drivers. Uh, Waze is interesting, they've now started a carpooling service in California right? where the costs of the ride are split between the driver and, and the user. So it's like a real, it's, car, it's actually a carpooling kind of 
of uh, uh, so, so these are all different business models, right? Using the same technology. And the question is, if we think about this, right, how does that address our concerns with regard to the risks and harms and the more general question of also how much do we profit from this activity? And the last one I want to throw out is this question of automation of work. Um, this is from the McKinsey study that 50% of current work activities are technically automatable by adapting currently demonstrated technologies. Right? And again, how we address this problem right, comes back to how we think about the business model of the various platforms with regard to artificial intelligence, companies, services that we're offering. And so that's just sort of the last kind of example to sort of throw out there for discussion with regard to how can we think about uh, this issue differently if we think about the business model itself right, with the technology embedded inside of it. So to summarize, for a responsible business, there has to be a real understanding of key technological developments, how to understand the business opportunities and associated risks, to articulate the societal value proposition of the business opportunities, and at the same time develop the culture and systems and organizations to anticipate, identify, and avoid harms. And then lastly, acknowledge the need to innovate the business model just as much as we want to focus on innovating the technology. And this is the part that I think gets lost in the context of much of this discussion. We focus so much on innovating the technology. Right? But there's also a lot of innovation that we can do in the context of the business model itself. And maybe that'll actually help to address some of the kinds of problems that we're talking about. So what do we talk about next steps? I want to avoid this situation for my students both in terms of losing and also in terms of holding their head like this. And so how can we do that? <laughs> how can we do that? Um, and I think I, some of you may have been at the dinner the first night where I mentioned what I think that we can do, at least in the context of the business school, for our students, not just here at Harvard Business School, but at business schools around the world where many of our cases are used, is to really think about developing cases that help our students understand right, what are those technological opportunities and risks because not all of them are coming from a technology background. Secondly, how can they actually ask the right questions to identify potential ethical issues? How can they ask the right questions to know what could be done about them? And then thirdly, how can they think about implementing within the organizations the systems and culture needed to raise those questions and become aware? And how can they think about combining both the business technology, the business and the technology together in a way right, that avoids some of those harms and at the same time really increases the value to society. We don't have the luxury of 50 years that Nike had to move from thinking about the risks, not even recognizing them, then recognizing them and avoiding responsibility for them then taking responsibility on board, and then finally thinking about the business model. Right? We don't have the luxury of time, given the scale, the scope, and the speed as we're talking about these kinds of technological developments. And so my ask to you right, is to help us in the business world think about real cases that we can write. I've written one on Apple and privacy and safety. I've written one on gender and free speech at Google. But what are the cases that we can write right, that will really help our students make sure that they think about these issues in a much quicker time cycle than the 50-year one that we talked about earlier. So thanks very much for your time, and I very much look forward to our discussion.